the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the truth that we have in front of us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself to us in a book. And Lord, you desire that we understand. You desire that we, God, grow in grace and in the knowledge of your will. And so, Lord, tonight, as we are here tonight to study, to look at your word together, to go through these passages of Scripture, I just pray that you would help us to grow into maturity, help us to believe in Jesus more, help us to... Be who you want us to be, God. Don't let us settle where we're at, but let us grow in grace and in the knowledge of your will. Lord, bless this time, anoint this time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight we are looking at one of the greatest manifestations of the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are going to begin considering what takes place here in John chapter 11. And I want to remind us why it is that we read and study God's eternal word. John wrote this gospel, as we know, in order, he said in John chapter 20, in order that we may believe, and that believing we may have life in his name. We study the word of God, we read the word of God, that we may know Jesus, that we may see him, with our eyes of faith, that we may become less detached to the things and the influences of this world, and that our mind might be renewed to think after God, think thoughts after God, to think as He thinks, and to will our own will as His will is. We study that we may know Jesus and truly know Him, that we may know his heart, that we may be able to say with the Apostle Paul that I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. We study the word of God not in order just so we may know facts but we study the word that we may know him that we may be pleasing to him in our daily life and in our walk with him. You see there is no one listen there is no one above Jesus. He has the name which is above every name right now. This isn't, we're not waiting for that to take place. He has the name which is above every name. Colossians chapter 1, it says that he is above all things. That he is the preeminent one. That you do not go on to higher knowledge. 
You don't begin with Jesus and then move on to deeper things when it comes to the things of God. Jesus is the deepest thing. Jesus is the preeminent one. There is no one above him. We study the word in order that we may know Christ because, as Paul said, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ. And as we look tonight, we see John records for us the seventh sign. This is the seventh sign that you see within the Gospel of John. He begins, as we begin looking at this... We read in John chapter 2 that Jesus came to Cana of Galilee and he turned water into wine, showing his power over creation, that he is able to take water and turn it into wine. In John chapter 4, at the end of John chapter 4, a nobleman came to Jesus who had a son that was sick and he asked the Lord to come and Jesus said, it spoke a word and said, your son lives wasn't even there, and the nobleman's son was made well. In John chapter 5, Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda, and there was a man that was crippled for 38 years, and he simply said to him, take up your bed and walk. And he was made whole. John chapter 6, Jesus seeing the multitude that tarried with him, 5,000 men, not including women and children. He took five loaves, which would have been the size of a little bit bigger than a Twinkie, a boy's lunch. He took five loaves of bread and two sardines and multiplied it to feed a multitude of people. In John chapter 6, we see that Jesus walks out upon the Sea of Tiberias, treading upon the waves. In John chapter 9, he came to a man who was born blind, put mud on his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he came back seeing. But here in John chapter 11, we we are going to see a miracle that shows us Jesus' power and glory over death itself. That Jesus is the giver of life. He is the one, as he will say later in this chapter, that I am the resurrection and the life. And he has authority over the grave and over death. In John chapter 10, we looked how Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, and he was in the temple, Solomon's porch, and it was winter, and we looked at that interaction that he had with the Jewish leaders, and it ended with them picking up stones to kill him. We read how Jesus escaped out of their hand. It's the winter And it says that he went to Beth Bara. He went beyond the Jordan where John was initially baptizing, which is Beth Bara. Roughly 25 miles away, he left Jerusalem and he went 25 miles. John chapter 11, we're going to see what took place in between that feast of dedication and John 12 where he enters in to Jerusalem for the last time at the feast of Passover. John 11, we get the interlude of what takes place because the next time he enters into Jerusalem in John 12, he is handed over. He is betrayed and ultimately crucified. But here's what we see in John chapter 11. Let's consider this together. Verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Here we are introduced in the Gospel of John to a man by the name of Lazarus. And we're told Lazarus is sick, and it must have been 
not just a, a normal sickness, but a serious sickness. Lazarus means, his name means, which is a Greek version of Eleazar, it means God is my help which is fitting for what we're about to, to see. But he's from the town of Bethany. Bethany was two miles outside of Jerusalem. It was right next to Jerusalem. Just right on the outskirts. Two mile walk to Bethany. And we're introduced to this family, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we know from the other gospel writings that these were people that were special to the Lord. We're introduced to them in Luke chapter 10. Turn with me there. In Luke chapter 10. It says in verse 38, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Here we're introduced to these, this family. And this family must have been very close with Jesus. He probably, when each time he would come to Jerusalem, would stay with this family or be around this family. So they would have known the Lord Jesus. Verse 2 in John chapter 11, it says that it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we see that it is this Mary that John says in John 12 in verse 1 that took that fragrant oil, that expensive oil that was worth almost a year's wages and broke it over Jesus and put it on his feet and anointed him with that fragrant oil. It's this Mary whose brother Lazarus is sick. It says in verse 3, Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold the one whom you love is sick. They send word to Jesus, and they simply say the one that you love. Now, that would indicate to us that they must have been close to this family. We see how close he was that they just simply say the one that you love is sick. And from the reaction of the sisters when Jesus does come, I imagine that they fully expected him to get word that Lazarus was sick and make their way, make his way there immediately. Because of the way that they react when he shows up what they think is too late. It's interesting here that Jesus doesn't go and he doesn't even say a word. We've seen him do that, haven't we? We've seen him simply say, your son lives. We've seen the ruler of the Romans come and he spoke a word, and the servant was healed, but not here. He doesn't go, and he doesn't say a word. He says in verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He tells them that the ultimate end of this sickness will not be death. Jesus is in Bethbara. He's 25 miles away. This servant is sent. 
He's in Bethbara. He has a very fruitful ministry there. Verse 42 of John 10 says that many people believed. Many people believed. He's... And it's very likely that by the time, really likely that by the time this messenger gets there, either Lazarus is at the point of death or he's already dead. But Jesus says to the child, or he says to this messenger, he says to his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. This is all taking place that God may be glorified. Now I want us to see here, ultimately Lazarus is dead. He's already dead. He died. He's already, Jesus gets there and he's already dead for four days. But he says that this sickness will not end in death, but that this is happening so that God would receive glory and the Son of God would be glorified through it. Let me say something tonight to you and I who belong to Jesus. You have this statement that this sickness shall not end in death. And ultimately it didn't. Ultimately it didn't. But you and I, you realize you and I can take hold of that tonight? If you are a child of God, the ultimate end for you and I is not death. Yeah, we may attend a funeral for a believer, but the ultimate end is not death. Right? The end of all death in the life of the believer is going to end up in the glory of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that when Jesus comes back, it says he will be glorified in his saints? Do you realize the glory that Jesus will have when he says, come out of the grave? And it's not just one grave, it's every grave that belong, of the people that belong to him. And it will result, it will end up in the glory of Jesus. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he is coming to be glorified in his saints. Really, the ultimate end of death in the believer, it's not death, but it always results in the glory of God. Even my death and your death will result in the glory of God because it's not the end. This is what he says, this will not end in death. This is taking place so that the Son of God will be glorified through it. And then John adds this amazing statement in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loves them. He now Jesus loves, loved Martha. And her sister and Lazarus. He's not being callous. He's not being cold hearted. Right? He's not messing with them. Intentionally or. But Jesus loves them. Sickness has come. Death has come. And John makes it clear that Jesus loves this family. I think it's important for me. To say to you here as a pastor that in this life you are going to have sickness. In this life you are going to have death. And it's not because you don't have enough faith and it's not because you said the wrong thing and brought a curse. There are times, listen, when it is not God's will to heal. If you believe that it is always God's will to heal, you will carry a burden on your shoulders for the remainder of your Christian life when God does not heal. When God does not show up the way you think he should show up. 
And it, what ends up happening, and I've seen it, is that people who are believers and faithful and love the Lord, they enter into a time of sickness. They enter into a time of discouragement. And they wonder, where is God? Where is God? I want to say to you that God is sovereign. And there are times for His own will and His own purpose that He does not heal. We had a young lady in, in our church one time that was a young mother. She got sick and we had, I kid you not, we had special prayer meetings. We had people go to the hospital, anoint with oil. Pastors here and there and coming in. People giving words over people. And the person died. They knew Christ, the ultimate end is not death. Praise God, they're with the Lord. But they died. Lazarus is sick and he died. And here we see Jesus makes it clear, the Word of God makes it clear. He loves Mary, he loves Martha, he loves Lazarus. It's not that he didn't care. You go back, you read the book of Daniel, you read about the three Hebrew boys that were delivered in the fiery furnace, right? And they had a faith and they said, even if he doesn't deliver us, even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. And what did God do for the three Hebrew boys, the, the teenagers? What did he do? He showed up in the fire, right? But there's been a lot of people that were not delivered that were burned at the stake, that were thrown into the fire and were killed, that did have their head chopped off, that were fed to lions, that did experience persecution. There's been a ton of them throughout church history. And it's not that God didn't love them. It's not that he didn't care for them. It just was not his will that they be delivered. And you and I, we have to rest in the goodness of God even when we don't like what happens. Right? If you don't, you're going to backslide when something bad happens in your life. You're going to lose your joy. You're going to think God's mad at you. You're going to get mad at God. Oh, don't think this doesn't happen. This happens all the time. There are prodigals from this church. There are prodigals from every church, backsliders, that got mad at God because something didn't turn out the way they thought it should go. Right? Right? But you see, John makes it clear Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. I just want to show you something. I want, to, I want to show you that this is the type of Christian we need to be. We may never ever be called to be this type of Christian. Ever. We, we probably won't be called to be this type of Christian. Ever. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But this is the type of Christian that we need to be. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 8, this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus. It says in verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Here's what Jesus said. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful until death. You're about to suffer. He said in Revelation 6, this is after the fifth seal is opened. And this is where you see the martyrs in heaven underneath the altar crying out, How long? How long? Verse 9 it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. This indicates that there are a number of people that are going to be martyred. Right? And he says, wait till the number's complete. That is, throughout all church history, throughout all church history, there's going to be people who are killed for Christ. And it's not that he doesn't love them, and it's not that he can't deliver them. Right? You see, that's the, that's the type of Christian we need to be. Here you see God loves Mary and Martha. Jesus loved them. And look at what he does. So, verse 6, So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now I can only imagine... What Mary and Martha and the rest of the family would have been going through, right? Lazarus gets sick. There had to have been a point where they see, like, he, he's not getting better. He's not improving. They, there had to be a point where they get to, uh, where they're desperate and they say, You gotta, where did Jesus say he was going? Oh, he's in Beth Bara. Send somebody. Send somebody to tell him. They send a messenger and they're probably pacing and they're wringing their hands and they're sitting by Lazarus. They're going, where is he at? Right? The doctor would probably come from Jerusalem already. Whatever medical help they would have had back then had probably already been there and said, he's going to die. And they're sitting there probably looking out maybe on the road every once in a while going out and do you see a company of people coming yet? Maybe the messenger made his way back and Lazarus is already dead because he most likely would have already been dead and, and the messenger walks in and sees Lazarus dead and then says, well, Jesus said this would not be unto death, right? Right? And the guy's already dead. Jesus waits two days. Verse 7. We see the sovereign timing. Then after this he said to his disciples... Let us go to Judea again. 
Remember, Jesus had left Jerusalem in John 10 with the leaders ready to kill him. He escaped. They were ready to kill him. His disciples in verse 8, they think they're reminding him. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are, are you going there again? It's like, man, you're, uh, are you trying to get killed? And then Jesus makes this statement to show us that he's on a different timetable than what the disciples understand. He says to them in verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus says, If I'm walking during the day, I can see I'm not going to stumble. He's using this analogy just like he did in John chapter 9 to tell them that his earthly ministry is the day. He's, he's walking in the daytime. He knows he has an appointed time. He knows he has an appointed task by the Father. And he's walking in the day. The night is coming. The night's coming when he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. And he's not going to be able to do. He's not going to be able to work and heal and do the miracles and the things that he's doing. But here he's saying, while I am walking in the day, I'm safe. While I'm doing what the Father sent me to do. And just like we talked about in John chapter 9, Jesus had a work to fulfill. And he would fulfill it and nothing would stand in his way until it was done. Verse 11, he says, These things he said after that he... And after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Sleep in the word of God, in this sense, is a euphemism for death. When he came to Jairus' daughter who was dead. He said, she's not dead, but she's asleep. And they ridiculed him. Stephen in Acts chapter 9, it says, as he was dying, it says he fell asleep. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 it speaks of believers who sleep in Jesus. That is, they died in Jesus. Here he says, Lazarus is asleep. His disciples said, Lord, verse 12, if he sleeps, he will get well. That is, to be able to find rest and sleep was a good sign during sickness. They thought that it meant that he was getting better. Remember, he said this sickness is not unto death. They think he's getting better. Verse 13, he says, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And he says that I am glad, verse 15, for your sakes, that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. He tells them, I'm glad. He's not glad that he died. He's not glad that Mary and Martha are going through what they're going through. But he's glad that he's not there and that they are going to see this miracle in order that they may believe. Oh, to be an eyewitness, to be a disciple, and to be standing there. It's interesting when you study this out. There were certain Jewish traditions that they, they believed that a spirit hovered around the body for three days. They, they literally had 
a type of superstition where they believed that a spirit would hover around a body for three days. And so Jesus, what does he do? He waits till he's dead for four days. In order that they may believe. Right? And then he says, let's go to him. Verse 16, Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, there's different ways that this has been interpreted. Thomas has a reputation, doesn't he? He's, he's, er, he's earned it, maybe probably not to the degree that he has it. But Thomas is doubting Thomas. One, one person said, I like to call him logical Thomas. He's logical. But here I don't think this is a negative statement that he's making. I think this is him actually saying, if he's about to go back there, let's go die with him. I think it's him actually showing his loyalty to Jesus and his courage. Let's go and let's die with him. Verse 17, it says, So when Jesus had come... He found that he had already been in the tomb four days. So he gets there. He's four days dead. That'd be a good band name, wouldn't it? Four days dead. He's in the grave for four days. Verse 18, it says, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. You get this scene that's been four days. And, and Jewish people didn't just mourn for a day. They didn't just have a, a visitation and a funeral and then go about their lives. This was, this was, they had professional mourners. They would call in people. So there would be honor given in the morning. There would be people who were professional wailers who would wail. And here... Verse 20, it says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. She runs out. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, My brother would not have died. Lord, if you would have been here, Martha thinks that he's too late. Right? It's already over. She said in verse 22, But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give. What faith? Oh my goodness. What faith. This shows you the character of this woman. This shows you the heart of this woman. That even now, whatever you ask, verse 23, Jesus says to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's thinking ultimate, right? She's thinking, yeah, you're right. You know, we say that when we go to funerals. We do. We say that. This is not it. The resurrection is coming. That's true. There, there is going to be a great getting up morning, as the old hymn used to say. The great getting up morning. There's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a rapture of the, the body of Christ. When Christ comes, when those who are in the graves are going to come up. And this is Martha's understanding of what Jesus said. I know that at the last day, at the end, this is going to happen. 
Jesus said to her, this is one of these I am statements. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. She's thinking of a future event. And he makes it clear to her, the resurrector is right here, right now. Right? I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who is going to shout at the last day in every grave, open up and meet me in the air. I am here at this moment. I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, he who believes in me, though he die... Though he may die, he shall live. Remember, death is not the end for you and I. We don't die. Yes, this outward unredeemed body does stop uh, existing in the form that it is when we die. Our spirit immediately goes to be with the Lord. We enter into his presence. But there is going to come a day when Jesus comes again. When this body that was put into a grave and it could be corrupt. It could be ate up with cancer. There could be blockages in the heart. There could be missing limbs. There could be all kinds of things wrong with that body. It could have diabetes and it could have a messed up pancreas and a brain, brain damage. All oh, all these different things are sown into the ground. But when Jesus comes, that body, and I don't care how it was put into the grave, and I don't care how long it's been in the grave, it's going to come up out of the grave. It's going to reunite with your spirit, and you will have a resurrected, glorified body for all eternity. Praise God. Never get fat. Right? Never see corruption. Never get sick. Amen? Ever again. This is what Jesus is saying. Though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You'll never experience the second death. You'll never be out of the presence of God. Do you realize right now we will never be out of the presence of God? I right now have eternal life. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. I have eternal life right now. And I will never experience separation from God. Ever. Amen. She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Oh, what faith. Oh, look at the faith of Martha. You are the Son of God. And here we see verse 28. We're almost done. And when she said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I want you to, can you give me five more minutes? Give me five more minutes. This is so, therefore, listen, this is Jesus. This is our Savior. This is our Savior. He's sitting right now at the right hand. 
He's on the throne right now. This Jesus. Right now. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, this is some of the most, this is shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept. He wept. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what families go through. Right? He knows there is a God in heaven right now who knows what we feel in these moments. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Why in the world did he weep? He knows what he's getting ready to do. He said it's not unto death. He says that what's about to take place is going to bring glory to the Father and glory to, through the Son or to the Son. So here you see Jesus wept. He wept. Here you see God, the God of all creation, is getting a first-hand view and experience of what death does in the world. Here he's getting a first-hand view of what sin has caused in the world that he created. He knows he's going to go to the cross and conquer death, but here he gets a view of what sin has caused. And he weeps. Where have you laid him? Verse 36. Then the Jew says, see how he loved him. Some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. For he's been dead four days. It wasn't typical for them to embalm. That was an Egyptian thing. So he's been decomposing. They probably anointed him and wrapped him. They, they probably did all that they could to preserve but they wrapped him up and Martha says he's been dead for four days. Four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Where do spirits in the Old Testament go when they die? You see instances in the Old Testament where God spoke to Moses and said, Come up on Mount Pisgah, you will be gathered to your fathers. He said to Aaron, You're going to go up here. And he told Moses, I want you to take the priestly garments off of Aaron, put them on Eleazar, because Aaron is going to be gathered to his fathers. Where did the pre-resurrection saints go when they died? Well, Jesus gives us a little understanding of that, that there were two compartments in Sheol. 
Sheol simply is the Greek for the place of the dead. And there were two compartments. Hades and Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was a term that was used to describe where the righteous dead went. And I'm not trying to dramatize this, but can you imagine Lazarus down in Abraham's bosom, right, with the righteous dead? And he hears, Lazarus, come forth. Some people say that Jesus had to say his name because if he simply said, come forth, all the righteous dead, would have came out. But he stands at the empty or the tomb where Lazarus is and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And here's what took place. Verse 44. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth and Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. The resurrector had come. Listen. Jesus may not come and he may not do what we think he should do, when we think he should do it, right? But the sovereign Lord is never too late, right? He never errs and he never goes wrong in what he does. And here we see his power, even over death. The seventh sign. Next time we're together, we're going to see what the result of this is. But let's pray tonight. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we believe, we confess with Mary that you are the Son of God who has come into the world. We believe what you told to Martha, that you are the resurrection and the life. We believe, God. Jesus, we see your compassion. We see once again that you were truly man and you felt what we feel. You are truly God, sovereign even over the grave. And Lord, we believe, we trust in you. And Lord, help us to fall more in love with you, God. To know you, to trust you. May the word of God that we've looked at find good soil in the heart of your people. Bless your people. Strengthen them by your word. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 